early sample of what's to come. Please welcome Charlene Lomar. Thank you, Gordon. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me a second here to move from Kayleen to me. Here we go. Uh, the Stuart Bit Players is the name of the course that I will be giving here at Oakmont starting in January for SSU. This is a follow-up course to the one I taught last year, which was about the kings and queens of that dynasty. Uh, this is the cutting room floor. <laughs> All the things that I couldn't fit in because the politics is so uh, very complex in the 1600s. And one of the things that happened during the Stuart dynasty is the last grammatical shift in the English language. So I grab that as an excuse to talk about the entire history of the English language. And so what I'm going to give you today is half of that. Uh, other things that I will be talking about, uh, the scientific revolution, what it was like to live then, what the medicine was like, what the art was like, and then of course, theater. I mean, when you begin the century with Shakespeare, you have to talk about theater. So that is what the Stuart Bid Players is going to be about. And today, I'm going to give you the kernel, the, the central ideas from my two-hour talk of the um, evolution of English. So let's begin. Language changes. Every language in every location around the world, in every time period, is always undergoing change. Two processes are simultaneously acting on every language at every time. One is accretion, adding to the language, making new vocabulary, making more nuanced grammatical distinctions. These processes continually happen in a language. Another process that's working is simplification. Things are being trimmed away, forgotten, and lost that are no longer useful in a language. So both of these are ongoing. But generally, a language is in one or the other mode. Either it's mostly in accretion mode or mostly in simplification mode. An example of accretion is Navajo. Here is a language that for hundreds of years was fairly isolated. And most of the people learning this language were children. So we know what geniuses children are at picking up their native language. From the beginning to the age of about seven, children are acquiring one or more languages in the area of the brain known as Broca's area, which is just above your left ear. And that will continue to process that language throughout your lifetime. But that is a short developmental phase. And beyond the age of seven, any language that you try to acquire is no longer handled by Broca's area. It's the brain around Broca's area that's trying to learn. And it is not as talented at picking up language. Those of you who have struggled as an adult learner understand this. So, an accretion mode language is an isolated language where children are the ones learning the language. They master it by the age of five, six, seven. They know every sound, every grammatical nuance. They have it completely mastered. They will continue to add vocabulary as they get older but they've got the essence of the language down pat. Anything they learn beyond that is now going to give them the same difficulty it would give us today. An accretion mode language, therefore, is isolated, children learners, and it has a slow process of adding. As those children get to be teens, of course, they have to have their own vocabulary. They have to distinguish themselves from their parents. So the language continues to change, but it changes slowly, and it gets more complicated. We took advantage of that with Navajo in World War II. 
when we had native Navajo speakers come up with the code that was our uh, code that we used in the Pacific Theater that the Japanese never broke because their language is so complex and so different. So that's an accretion mode language. Simplification takes over as a process impacting a language when one language group comes in contact with another. And this can happen because you have trade, or you have immigration, or outright conquest. So now you suddenly have adult speakers of two different languages who have to figure out how to communicate with each other. They're trying to learn a language as adults. So they're never going to master that new language the way children do. They simplify the language they're trying to learn. And if there are enough people that are trying to learn this new language, the complete language can be permanently simplified. It's a very rapid process because those adults need to communicate now. And it is something that can be very drastic. So these two processes are constantly in play. And we're going to watch, as we go back to the roots of English, how these processes have impacted our language. So we have to go all the way back to the roots of English. Most modern languages spoken today in Europe and in the subcontinent of India are very similar at the root. So much so that linguists have been able to project backwards what the parent language must have been of all of these Indian and European languages. And they call that parent language Indo-European. They figure that it probably was spoken about 7,000 years ago in this pink area here, the steppes of Russia, by nomadic tribes. These tribes spread out east and west, taking their language with them. Now they're spreading out into rather sparsely populated areas. And that means that they end up as isolated pockets of Indo-European speaking. So now their language is in isolation, and it goes into accretion mode, meaning each of these little pockets is changing their language by adding to it, making it more complicated, changing the grammar, changing the pronunciation, until these different little pockets no longer understand each other. So this is what happened with Indo-European over the course of hundreds and thousands of years. And we're going to focus on what happened in the western edge. As Indo-European got all the way to the Atlantic seaboard, we can see that the northern part of Europe and Scandinavia are speaking a Germanic sub uh, piece of Indo-European. The southern part, the part we call France and Spain, and the British Isles, are speaking a Celtic language at this point. Then the Roman Empire arrives. They're speaking Latin, which is an Indo-European language, and they overrun these areas that are speaking Celtic. They do not take command of the areas that are speaking the Germanic version. But they do, in 43 AD, take over what the Celts call Britannia. The Celts call themselves Britons. So from 43 AD, for 300 years, these Latin speakers are in charge of what we call England. And they are a very thin administrative layer. The majority of the people living there are continuing to speak Celtic, and they have very little contact with this administrative layer. So there isn't a lot of influence on either Latin or Celtic, although this goes on for 300 years. Then the Roman Empire falls apart, and we get chaotic movements of people in all sorts of directions. The part we're interested in is up here. We see that with the departure of the Roman troops from Britain, 
we get a whole bunch of immigration coming from Northern Europe. These are all <coughs> tribes that are speaking a Germanic language. So we see the Angles and the Jutes and the Frisians and the Saxons and the Danes are pouring in to Britannia. And they're bringing their Germanic dialects with them. They're also bringing entire clans. Their families come as a whole. And they settle. So many of them come that they push the Celts all the way to the western border. And now the Celts are semi-isolated from each other. This group up here starts developing in a different direction from the other Celtic pockets. This becomes Scottish Gaelic. Down here, we have Welsh developing, and Cornish down here, and of course in Ireland we get Irish Gaelic. So those languages still exist today in the British Isles, but they were overwhelmed by this Germanic immigration that came in. And so all of these areas to the eastern edge of the island are groups that speak very similar Germanic dialects. So as they move around and get themselves settled, they come up with a combination of their dialects that is going to be a single language. This single language is named after this largest group, the Angles. The Angles call their new country Angleland. England. They speak Angle-ish, English. So this language that they combine and come together with is called Old English. So we have the departure of the Romans, we have the immigration of the Germanic tribes which meld their, their languages into one, and Old English is spoken from the mid-400s to the mid-1100s. It's a Germanic language, and I want to give you a sense of what it was like. So we're going to experience the poem Beowulf. Beowulf was composed, not written, because this is not a literate society. It was composed around the year 700 AD. It was composed by a bard. A bard is a traveling uh, performer. He memorizes hundreds of poems and performs them accompanied by a lyre, a stringed instrument. And he goes around from village to village and performs as a way of making his living. So Beowulf is an action adventure. It's about 3,000 lines long, so we're not giving you the whole poem today. <laughs> what we are privileged to have is a performer who has mastered Beowulf, who can recite it in Old English, and he has taken the trouble to reconstruct a lyre based on fragments of lyres that we have found in Anglo-Saxon graves. He's had to kind of invent the stringing, he's had to invent the tuning, invent how you play this, but this is his best approximation of what it would have been like to sit in a mead hall, which is a giant community center, single room building that can hold most of the village, and recite this exciting poem. The story of Beowulf is written or composed in Old English, but it is set in Denmark. There is a king in Denmark who has a big problem. Every night, his mead hall is attacked by a monster named Grendel. And Grendel breaks in and eats the warriors. <laughs> Big problem. Now, the warriors normally could take care of this themselves, but Grendel is magical. He cannot be hurt by weapons. So this kingdom is just really undergoing constant predation. So a hero named Beowulf hears of this problem, and he comes to the king and he offers his services. I and my band of kin warriors will rid you of Grendel the monster. So the portion of the poem that we're going to hear 
is from the time that the king and his warriors leave to meet Paul, Beowulf and his warriors settle down and go to sleep and wait in ambush for Grendel to come. So let's hear Benjamin Bagley <coughs> recite this exciting section of the poem. And just so you know, you can tell from the illustration here, Beowulf reaches up and grabs the hand of Grendel. See if you can hear any English that's recognizable in this recitation.
because the poet does. At this point, he stands back and he goes, isn't this a marvelous mean hall? Wow, look at those sturdy timbers and the gilding and the weapons on the... He goes on for quite a while. So this is a good point to interrupt. The rest of the battle is a tug of war between Grendel and Beowulf until Beowulf rips the arm off of Grendel at the shoulder. Grendel goes screaming into the night and dies. Beowulf, big hero. The poem goes on for 2,000 more lines. <laughs> His next challenge is even worse. He must conquer Grendel's mother. <laughs> so, I hope this gives you a sense of what it might have been like to sit around the heat, the hearth, in a mead hall and listen to one of the most exciting adventures of your culture spoken in Old English. Now, believe it or not, he's giving this particular performance in Sweden, and the Swedes are sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, they don't have subtitles. Yeah. They are understanding most of what he is saying. Yes. Yes. Because it's a Germanic language, mm -hmm. and it hasn't changed in Sweden as much as it has changed in England. Mm -hmm. So we're just like clues without those subtitles, huh? Mm -hmm. But... If you come to the Ollie course, I will prove that out of the first 15 words in this poem, 10 of them are words we use every day. They're just pronounced differently. So, we don't speak Old English today. Something must have happened. It began in 789. The Vikings began pouring out of the north attacking all of the margins of the British Isles and the coast of Europe. And they would come and do their pillaging and looting for the summer and go back home for the winter. The next summer, they come back again. After 10 years or so of this, some very bright Viking lads decided that winters in England were probably milder than winters back home. <laughs> And so they decided to stay year-round and to settle. So now we have a vast number, something like a quarter million of these men settling in old English-speaking England. And these red areas are where they settled. There is not quite a million populations speaking old English that they are coming with. Now, this migration, if you want to call it that, is not like the migration of the Angles and the Saxons and the Jews, who brought their entire tribes with them. These are just the men. They leave their families behind. So they're going to want to fit in right away. They want to woo themselves a wife. They want to raise children. They want to be involved in the community of majority Old English speakers. But they speak Old Norse. Old Norse is Germanic. It's very similar to Old English. Both languages are what we call inflected languages. That means that the pieces of the language that tell you the grammatical use of that word, who's doing what action to whom, are tacked on as little suffixes at the ends of words. So Old English has the word that we call stone, they pronounced it stan, and it has all these different suffixes to it. E, E, S, A, A, S, U, M, and you have to know when is the appropriate time to use which ending. Old Norse has the word stone as stein. Not that different, but their endings are all different from the English ending. And so here are adult learners trying to grasp all these different ways of saying stone. It's beyond them. So they just don't do it. They just drop it. And by the time they're done with English, instead of all these versions of stone, we have three. Stone, stone in the plural with an S on it, and stone with an apostrophe S as a possessive. That's all we have to worry about. 
Thank you, Vikings. <laughs> so they cause a drastic simplification of this language because there's so many of them, and they're all adult learners. So Old English now is gone, except for a few fossils. <clears throat> Even the Vikings were able to master some really common words, such as mouse, and its plural, mice. Now, today, we just add an S. But back in Old English, they would change the sound of the vowel in the middle of the word, mouse, mice. Goose, geese. Man, men. Woman, women. That was a way of forming plurals. And because these words are so common, the Norsemen were able to grasp that, and they remained in the language. So when your little toddler comes up and says, Mommy, Mommy, I saw two mouses. And you say, dear, it isn't mouses, it's mice. Huh? <laughs> Why? I don't know, it just is. <laughs> You're teaching them Old English. So we don't even speak the simplified version of Old English. So something must have happened. And this time, it's another invasion. These are the Normans coming from France to invade and conquer England in 1066. Norman is a shortened version of Norse men. Normandy was settled by Vikings about the same time England was settled by Vikings. So for 200 years, Norsemen have been speaking Old French. They now come as Normans and conquer this simplified Old English-speaking population. Now we have Anglo-Saxons speaking simplified Old English, and there are about two and a quarter million of them. And only 10,000 Normans come. So again, we have that very thin administrative layer at the top of English. Most of the people are speaking this simplified Old English. So French at the top, spoken in the courts, in Parliament, in uh, the uh, king's quarters. That is the language that is official. All of the <coughs> records of the country are kept in Latin, which is still there because it was Christianized before the Romans left. And so the church is still using Latin. So as far as official records are concerned, English pretty much disappears for two or three hundred years. Because nobody on the peasant level is writing anything down. So now we have this thin layer of French-speaking people administering the entire country full of people who are speaking this old Germanic language. And there are too few of them to have an impact on the grammar of English or its structure. But those servants that are working with their overlords are having to learn Old French, and they're bringing those words back home with them. So we begin borrowing massively from Old French. We get some 10,000 Old French words into our language. They don't displace the Anglo-Saxon they don't displace the Old English. They come in alongside. And because you've got the Anglo-Saxon servant living in a house and the Norman overlord living in a mansion, those words come in side by side. And they're still with us today. And they still have that class distinction. Which would you rather live in, a house or a mansion? <laughs> The uh, Anglo-Saxon servant is raising a pig, he eats pig, but when he serves it to the Norman overlord, it's pork. So these other words, veal, beef, mutton, are a little classier than what you have in the barnyard. So we have a fossil from this era that is the class system, still in our language. Because we have French at the top, we have Latin in the churches and the church courts, and in official records, and most of the people still speak this old English. We have a trilingual England, 
and we have a very rich, nuanced vocabulary. From the French, we can use the word royal. From the Latin, we can use the word regal. From Old English, we can say kingly. And you get a slightly different sense, whichever word you choose to use. So Old English is impacted by the Vikings to cause simpler grammar, and impacted by the Normans to add a massive new vocabulary. And those changes are so big that we now call the language Middle English. And it's spoken from the mid-1100s to the mid-1400s. And of course, this is going to be exemplified by Chaucer. Chaucer started writing in the mid-1300s, died in 1400. His most famous work is the Canterbury Tales. And we're going to hear an actor read these lines. Now, we can read these lines. This is, with my glasses, we can read these lines. A knight there was, and that a worthy man, that from the time that he first began to ride out, he loved chivalry. Chivalry is a French word. Uh, this is fairly straightforward, spelled a little strangely, but we can read it. And it's Middle English. This is what Chaucer wrote. But if we heard Chaucer say this, it's a whole different story. Because Chaucer is still using Old English pronunciation. So I'm going to have an actor read this. And you can follow along fairly easily as far as the text goes. Then I'm going to let him continue beyond the text. And see if you have tuned your ear enough to Middle English that you can understand what he's saying without words to help you. I'll give you a hint. He's giving you a list of battles that this uh, knight has fought in. So here we go with the a Middle English. English there was, and that a worthy man. But for the teamer that he first began to read and moot, a lovely chivalry, truth and honor, freedom, and courtesy. Full worthy was he in his lord's wearer, and thereto had he ridden no man fairer, as well in Christendom as in Hethnessa, and ever honoured for his worthiness. And Alessandra he was, when it was wonder. Full after him he had the board begun, above all the nations in Prusa. In Leto had he rised, and in Rusa, no Christian man so oft of his degree. In Gernad at the sage, eg had he bay of Algazir, and ridden in Belmaria. At Lies was he, and at Satalia, when they were wonna, and in the greater say, at many a nobler army had he bay. At mortal battles had he been fifteener, and Fauchten for her fife at Tramisena in Listis Trius, and I slain his foe. And I slain his foe, and yes, killed his foe. Slain. I slain his foe. So, he is pronouncing this as though it were still Old English, but he's writing it down in words that we recognize. We recognize them because Printing came in while we were still speaking Middle English, and it froze our spelling in Middle English form. That's why it's so darn hard to spell. <laughs> so we're not talking like that anymore. Something must have happened. In 1348, bubonic plague hit. It, for the next three years, ravaged England by the end of those three years, some half of the population was dead. People were fleeing in front of it, did them no good. After so many died, there were many very prosperous, empty lands. And people moved to take advantage of those empty spaces. So the Black Death coming initially for three horrific years, and then every summer after that, sometimes at epidemic levels, sometimes very low, kept the population moving. Now, we're not talking about different languages coming in contact with each other. We're talking about different dialects. It's spoken a little differently in the north. 
in the west, in the south, and those dialects are now impacting each other with this geographical churning of the population. Then in 1455, two noble houses, the Yorks and the Lancasters, decide to squabble over the throne. So for 30 years, there is civil war. And one house will win, the other house falls. Starts mixing with its lower social class. Then they rise up and the first house falls back and forth for 30 years. So we have a churning through the social layers as well as a geographical churning. So the language is getting a huge impact from all of this movement so that it changes the way it is pronounced. And linguists call this the Great Vowel Shift. <laughs> it's always done in capital letters, and you must lower your voice in reverence. The Great Vowel Shift. And what it means, technically, is that short vowels that we used to say in the back of our mouth, we now move forward and up, in case you wanted to know. That is the vowel shift. But what it meant was that Chaucer, who died in 1400, if he came across Shakespeare, who was at his peak in 1600, just 200 years later, and they met on the street, they couldn't understand each other. They could write down what they had to say and read it, because we're still using Middle English spelling, but they couldn't understand what the speech was. So this is the great vowel shift, and you can see it in some of the words, feet, which was um, used in the Old English Beowulf poem, fate und vollbar. Fate is the way it was pronounced in Old English. Fate is the way it was pronounced by Chaucer. We say feet. That's a vowel shift. The word night has even changes in the consonants, because in this reading we just heard, a knicht there was. Chaucer pronounced the K. He pronounced that GH as a kind of explosion of breath. Knicht. And the vowel in the middle is icht. Shakespeare says night. No K, no GH, and he changes the vowel. So these two men could not understand each other if they met. And we're stuck with that Middle English spelling because in Shakespeare's time, there was this big question, do we change all our books now? We've had books for 200 years, and they've all got Middle English spelling. I mean, do you move from your LPs to your CDs? Well, you're kind of forced to, but. So the big question was, do we reform the spelling? Well, yes, of course. But then, whose pronunciation do you take? Because London says it differently from Wessex or Kent or Northumbria. And so they just gave up, and we still have Middle English spelling. So Middle English is impacted by the plague with a geographical churning and the War of the Roses with a social class churning to change the way we pronounce it. But we're not yet at modern English. We're at early modern English. That's what Shakespeare spoke. And it was from the mid-1400s to the mid-1600s. Let's hear what Shakespeare might have sounded like. This is an actor, John Barton, who's trained in what they call original pronunciation. And he will give you a speech from Shakespeare's Henry V. It's intriguing to think of what Shakespeare in verse would have sounded like during the Renaissance. John Barton an expert on speaking Shakespeare, thinks it would have sounded like this. Once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or we'll close the walls up with our English dead. In pace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when a blast of war blows in our air, then imitate the action of the tigger, stiffen the sinews, Summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favours rage, then in the eye a terrible aspect, let it pry through the head like the portage of the brass cannon, <coughs> let the brow overwhelm it, as fearfully as doth the goal is rock, or hang and judge his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. 
Ocean. If we met Shakespeare in the street, we could carry on a conversation. And isn't that remarkable? 200 years between Chaucer and Shakespeare, and they can't talk to each other. 400 years between us and Shakespeare, and we can. But his English is not quite our English. So, something must have happened. Yes, we can say that it's true. Something must have happened. All right, and in this case, it is civil war. In 1642, King Charles I declared war on his own parliament. And this war went on until 1648. Very long, very bloody. Both parliament and the king raised forces from all over England and mixed them together in huge armies. Then these armies tramped all over England. So once again, we get a big mixing of dialects. This time, we get a simplification of grammar. <coughs> we lose the third person verb form that ends in ETH, such as he goeth or she giveth. Shakespeare uses those forms. We don't. He also uses the modern forms that we use. We also lose the second person familiar. Thou, thee, thy, and thine, and its accompanying verb form that ends in EST, thou goest, thou dost, that disappears from everyday speech. It's still sort of part of our language because we have kept the King James Bible, which is written in early modern English, and we have Shakespeare. So we understand those forms, but we don't use them. By the end of the Civil War, this final Simplification in English grammar is complete. And for 400 years, the language is remarkably stable. But other forces are at work. In this same century, we have the first massive globalization. The English, among other peoples, are spreading out over the entire globe. They are planting colonies here in America in the 1600s. And they get a foothold in India. They're trading in the West Indies and in the East Indies. And they are dropping off little pockets of English-speaking peoples to live permanently in these places all over the globe. Well, we now know what happens when you have isolated pockets of a language. It continues to change, and it changes differently than the changes that are happening in the other pockets. So we now have American English, Canadian English, Jamaican English, English spoken in India. If you've ever had a technical phone call, you know it's not our English. <laughs> so these are accretion mode pockets of English that are changing the language, the same thing that happened to Indo-European 7,000 years ago. So eventually, these will be mutually unintelligible unless something stops that. And early modern English is now impacted by the Civil War causing simplification in grammar and globalization causing <coughs> this local accretion, changes that are diverging from each other, plus we're pulling in vocabulary from all over the world. So we're increasing the complexity of our vocabulary as well. Luckily for us, there are stabilizing forces. We are a global world. We are a global society. We have international news. Someone who puts out news to all the English-speaking pockets <coughs> is going to want to have a standardized version of English that they can depend on being understood in all of those places. International business does the same thing. You want to be able to take a meeting in Japan, or in India, or in Tibet, and be able to understand each other. The international culture also is a stabilizing influence. We're sending out movies, TV programs, books, and music. We're getting them back. We get Bollywood movies from India. We get a huge film industry output from Australia, and of course, their music and books as well. So we have this opportunity to keep English mutually intelligible, but it is changing in all of these different areas. So
So let's recap where we've been. We begin with a mashup of Old Germanic dialects, which create Old English. This is the language of Beowulf, and it is uh, spoken from the mid-400s to the mid-1100s, and then it is impacted by the invasion and immigration of the Vikings, who drastically simplify its grammar. And then here come the Norsemen, the French Vikings, and they add French to our vocabulary. These two impacts create Middle English, which is what Chaucer spoke. And that is spoken from the mid-1400s to the mid, um, no, I'm sorry, mid-1100s to the mid-1400s, and it is impacted by the plague, moving people geographically, and the War of the Roses, moving people through social status, and that gives us the battleship. Then we have Shakespeare speaking early modern English, and his English is impacted by the English Civil War, which then changes our grammar for its last time with another simplification, getting rid of those two verb forms and be thou, thy, and thine. Then globalization is now spreading English all over the globe where it is changing locally. And we hope keeping in touch with everybody else so that we can continue to understand each other. And that's the state we're in now as modern English, but language changes. And so something will impact English. We don't know what, we don't know when, and we don't know what the form of modern English will become in the future. But we can count on the fact that it will change. And that is the evolution of English. I want to remind you when we go to question and answer to wait for the microphone and if you'll hold it on the horizontal so we can record you for all time your questions. And thank you. I just wanted to throw in uh, I, I watched a time class movie just the other night. Uh, oh, I watched a movie on Turner Classic Movies the other evening, uh, My Fair Lady. And there's no question that dialect was entirely different. And uh, Rex Harrison obviously made the attempt and successfully to change uh, the Got a snack. Uh, a flower vendor, uh, and to make her sound like a countess, which he alleged he could do. So, and he could recognize, uh, recognize the dialect and what where, what part of England she'd be from. And just as we can say, you're a southerner, you're um, a, a New York, definitely a New York. So the question, I. I just was <laughs> pointing out that things aren't changing. It's the only thing that I can sense that, that things change were that performers like the Beatles certainly can change things. Sure. Have. When the Beatles came in, we picked up Fab. We picked up, you know, their their little uh, versions of words. Um, yes, this idea that there are dialects constantly, there are always dialects. You want to experience a vowel shift? Go south of the Mason-Dixon line. Y'all hear it? It's spoken very differently down there. Those vowels are not what we use. Okay? Uh, I have read that human speech, not language, is only 50 to 75,000 years old uh, because we have no fossil record of the larynx because it's not made of bone. Is that true? Oh, well, what is the guess as when humans begin to speak, to recognize and make words and so on? So, do you have any thoughts? As you pointed out, we do not have any fossilized speech. We really don't have anything to carbon date. What we do have is what are called endocasts. They have brain cases. Frequently, the brain case survives in a fossil hominid, 
and they can sort of get an idea of the sections of the brain that are available at that point. And looking back for Broca's area, uh, 50,000 is a, um, a conservative estimate. It's very possible that it goes back to 100,000 years to the beginning of modern humans, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, but we really don't know. The other thing that we look at in the fossils is the hyoid bone, uh, bone in the uh, throat, which is part of what allows us to, to manipulate our sounds so uh, variously. Chimps can speak, but they can't speak with the nuances that we can. But that bone doesn't fossilize very often. So we're kind of guessing that it's back at the beginning of modern humans. Don't really know. One of the difficulties that uh, especially foreign students, but also American students, have with the language is spelling. Do you see a modern uh, uh, move to change the spelling? Yes, we frequently have this motion made. All right, let's modernize our spelling. But we come back to the same dilemma that Shakespeare's time faced. Whose are you going to choose? Are you going to do BBC English? Are you going to do American? Are you going to do Australian? Heaven forbid, Indian? <laughs> and we just fall back on the old, well, we have all these thousands of books that are written in Middle English spelling, and why learn it all over again? So we're kind of stuck. I think I'm next. Right, so. um, <clears throat> Where are we? I like, back here. Thank you. Back here. Um, I'd like you to comment on something that you said, which was uh, in the middle of your uh, talk, uh, that the upper class of England spoke French. Now, my understanding was that that broke down during the plague when the teachers of the, of the kids uh, were wiped out by the plague. And so they had to bring in Middle English speakers, and the kids picked up Middle English. And ever after, they all spoke Middle English and never French again. That makes sense to me as a theory. I have not come across that in my reading, but it does make sense. But there were many other factors by that point. 1348 is a long time after 1100, uh, at 1066. And uh, there were constant uh, situations like nannies who were the Anglo-Saxons raising the children. By 1325, we have a poem, uh, a man who says, uh, some people know French because they live in the court. Some people know Latin because they've been trained to be priests. But everybody, old or young, understands the English tongue. So that's 1325, which is just before 1348. So everybody is speaking it, but the prestige language is still French. There's another factor that comes in at that point, which is we are now in a hundred years war with France at that time, and it's not quite so cool to be speaking the language of the enemy. So Henry V, who in Agincourt, you know, earns himself the right to be the future king of France, decides that he is going to change that uh, upper level from French to officially being English. So by uh, 1365, Henry V says, we're speaking English here. It's no more French. And the, the law courts and parliament and everything shifts over. Good point. We take turns. Uh, I was just going to ask, in your summary, you uh, didn't mention Latin. Uh, do you see it as having much influence other than vocabulary? Yes, Latin had a huge influence, uh, mostly in Shakespeare's time, just a little prior and afterwards, in what they called ink horn words. And this is the rise of the Renaissance in general. The interest in ancient languages was pervasive. If you were university trained, you must learn Latin and Greek from well before. But in Shakespeare's time, they began incorporating a lot of those Latin and Greek words into English as a kind of show off. See, you know, I have a university education. I can throw Latinized words at you. So it 
also influence our grammar in that a lot of these silly rules that we have, like don't end your sentence in a preposition, that's a Latin rule. And snooty people said, well, we have to follow Latin grammar. No, we don't. We end English sentences with prepositions all the time. So yes, it had a huge impact besides the vocabulary. I want to ask you about the future. When I read um, something in the magazine today, there are so many of these letters in capitals <laughs> that I don't know anything about. Is that where we're going? In a way, it is. The youth culture has done texting. Texting is spelling with your thumbs. It's very limited. You don't want to have to spell out long words with your thumbs on your telephone. So they abbreviate a lot of things. And they are inventing a whole bunch of abbreviations very, very rapidly. L-O-L, -L, laugh out loud. And there are as many of those. So you can find dictionaries for that online if you really want to you know, get into it. Um, a major linguist named David Crystal has said, don't worry, texting is not going to ruin English. It will still be separated into its own little world because those kids know that if they bring texting spelling into their university exam, they're going to flunk. <laughs> so they are sensitive to the context that they're using it in, but it is beginning to permeate and it is one of the changes and it may bring us to some spelling changes in the future because they are drastically simplifying how you spell things as well. How do we know how Chaucer spoke and Shakespeare spoke? Very good question. And if you come to my uh, lecture, <laughs> you'll get a discussion from David Crystal as to how they do it. One thing is they have uh, writings from people of the period who are describing the sounds, because there are always multiple ways of saying things. And so they will describe, like Ben Johnson will say, we do pronounce the R. So they also are looking at internal rhymes, things that wind and mind don't rhyme for us, did for them. That gives us clues as well. And so they, they can sort of painstakingly piece this together all the way back to old English, because we don't have any of that sitting around either. But these are educated guesses. I mind. I mind next. <laughs> uh, the future of English, would you say that because of the prevalence of uh, English, particularly, for example, as a uh, uh, air traffic command is, is American English, our movies are pretty widespread, do you feel that perhaps the American brand of English will be more widespread, or will there still continue to be many, many dialects in different countries? There will continue to be dialects, and they will continue to change from each other. Currently, um, a lot depends on who taught these people English. For example, if you see a reporter go into deepest Africa and he sticks his mic in the face of a man wearing a loincloth, what you're going to hear is Oxford English, because that was a former English colony, and so they're learning British English. So that, that was such a huge global <coughs> phenomenon that British English is still the major form of English. But, as you say, things that are technologically up to date are usually in American English. So we're hoping that the fact that we all still have to talk to each other is going to keep it from spreading too far apart, but it will continue to diverge. Um, I, I noticed with uh, in, in today's English that people are dropping things like the ly in adverbs. Mm -hmm. You don't hear it very much anymore, even from television anchors and things like that. <laughs> so that seems to me that a lot of our grammar is being simplified. Can you comment on that? I think that there are a lot of forces towards simplification today in the world. The globalization itself, although it's giving us the accretion happening in pockets, the global language has got to get simpler, or all these adults who are learning it are going to have 
great deal of difficulty. I too have noticed the, diff the disappearance of the adverbial L-Y. Uh, and those kinds of simplifications, I think, will continue just from the pressure of having to maintain a standard that's simple enough for adults to learn it anywhere. Yeah, my question is similar to the last one. Anyway, you were talking about the stratification of uh, the, their different languages and so forth. And I noticed in today's world, a lot of people mix up the adjectives and, adje and a lot of people end in prepositions and so forth. Is that, I mean, even though they're educated, and my, my son got A's in Latin, and called, but he spoke terrible English. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you figure all this? <laughs> because he had somebody standing over him saying, you will do your Latin correctly. And apparently you weren't standing over him saying, you will do your English correctly. Which my grandmother did to me. <laughs> my grandmother was upholding the standards for me. Um, he's understood by his peers, I'm sure. And for most young people, that's what they care about. Until they get enough into the business world and begin to have to deal with the standards at business level, they're fairly careless. And you just hope that they're smart enough to pick it up when it matters. Thank you. One thing that really bugged me uh, is the use of functionality. The word? The word when function is just perfectly fine. <laughs> you take any term, any use of the word functionality, and I, don't, I, can't, I haven't found an example yet where function doesn't work just as well. There, now, right, go ahead. Now, is this a class issue? It, it is, it, it's now pervading society, but it started <laughs> off within the computer geekdom. Any particular isolated group is going to come up with its own usage of the language. Um, sports, for example, if you aren't tuned into a particular sport for a few years and you come back, you're going to go, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. It continues to change. We all have our own little pet peeves. Mine is on the ground. Boots on the ground. You don't have to say we're on the ground in Iraq. We're in Iraq. We are on the ground. <laughs> so these, these things arise and become popular because it's a new way of saying things. It's a faddish kind of thing. And uh, news anchors seem particularly prone to picking up word fads. And then they get spread all over the place. And nobody, again, no teacher is going, now wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. I had a question about what's... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A question about what's going on in academia. In the olden days, to get a PhD in science, you had to pass a test in French and in German. However, these tests were given by the science department, not the language department. So everybody always passed. <laughs> I didn't know that. I wouldn't take them. Two questions. Why aren't we studying Russian or Japanese? Or are these requirements at all still expected in academia advanced diplomas and degrees? Uh, I don't know why the standards of academia have fallen. I'm not part of academia. I'm not part of those discussions. I was a computer programmer for my, my career, so uh, language was the last thing they were worried about. Um, I, but I know here in California, I moved back here in 2004 and was totally shocked to find that the high school that my son was going to had so much lower standards than the California high school that I went through. Um, I think in general, our country has dropped the ball when it comes to education. We have dropped the funding and we have dropped the standards and No Child Left Behind is eviscerating our standards rather than raising them. So I, I have no explanation other than to say it's money at this point. Uh, one of the things that came up in the East Bay some time ago was eubonics. I'm curious as to where that went, if anywhere. And you know what it's worth. Eubonics is the study of black English. And it is a fascinating thing that I have not had the time to get into. 
So I don't uh, know the state of it at this point. I know people aren't talking about it so much anymore because I think they made their point back then, which was that Ebonics is a valid form of English. It happens to be in a uh, minority group that has been oppressed for a long time and therefore much of the country looks down on black English just from their cultural <coughs> prejudices. And, but they made the point that it is a valid form of English and deserves respect. I know there are people who are studying it. I would love to study it because I think it will be a primary example of simplification. We brought people from many different African tribes as adults to this nation. They couldn't talk to each other and they were forced to learn English as adults. And what came out of that is black English. And I, I know that they have essentially dropped the word to be. That's a big simplification. And I think there are many other instances to be found if we uh, do spend the time studying them. Yes. Uh, I noticed, uh, probably a lot differently than everybody else, that when you were reading or having the actors uh, read the uh, parts, that uh, I could actually understand them without the subtitles since I couldn't see them. Um, the thing that I've noticed recently, and I'm just wondering if this has got something to do with simplification, is that I can't understand the younger generation because they speak so fast. That's interesting. I, my son is 24 years old and I brought him to, uh, when I did the two hour version of this lecture at Vintage House uh, this last fall, and uh, he said, Mom, you talk so slow, you just bored them. <laughs> I'm like trying to speed through the material so I can fit it into that time period. So there, there is something going on in speed, and heaven help us, you know, we're going to be <laughs> left behind. But I find it fascinating that you say that you can understand a lot more because you're tuned into it orally, whereas we're focusing on the visuals. I love that. Do you see um, any move towards a word that stands for both he and she so that people will not use the plural of the there? to replace it. I don't. I, I have not come across any examples of that, but it would certainly be handy, wouldn't it? <laughs> Do we have any other questions? In the back. Uh, there was a comment earlier about the loss of language in academia. So, when I went through graduate school, um, in the 60s. Uh, German and French had dropped out as a requirement, it just dropped out, and it was replaced by, uh, if you could learn a computer language and program it, that was a replacement because it was a language. Um, and uh, part of this was the fact of the wars, that uh, French and German were no longer the dominant scientific uh, communities, and you didn't need to know French or German uh, because all of the publications were in English. So that's when that transition occurred, but then the next transition occurred when it became irrelevant to learn a programming language because you just bought it off the shelf or something like that. <laughs> that's my take on it. Yeah. <laughs> No, wait a minute. It's not irrelevant to learn those programming languages. I made a living out of it. <laughs> yeah, um, the political uh, scene is always going to affect what the relevant languages are. You had better have your grandchildren studying Mandarin right now. That's what you need to know. Not Russian, not German, not any of those. Those are easy to pick up compared to Mandarin. Yeah. Yes, the... Um, English uh, obviously uh, appears to be the predominant language of the world. However, much to the French dismay, if that is true, but the French have a French language police, and uh, they do have pockets of um, language in Canada and some of the uh, Caribbean islands. Can you speak to the French uh, future? Uh, will it be... Uh, 
uh, kept because of the language police in the French government. The French do have language police, so do the Italians, and they have been pretty much as ineffective as our grammarians. <laughs> <laughs> They, they constantly bemoan the state of French in Montreal. It's getting away from them. They can't stop it. In fact, uh, Sir, uh, uh, Samuel Johnson, the one who wrote the first major English dictionary in 1755, says in his preface, I for a while uh, honored myself with the notion that I could fix our language, not meaning make it, repair it, but stop it from change. And he said, what you are asking me to do is stop the world from folly and affectation. <laughs> you can't stop it. Thank you, Charlie, for such a great presentation today. We will be appearing here uh, in Oakland uh, at Lifelong Learning starting in January. Thank you. Thank you.